Mara tribe members watching, listening to this, it's available on YouTube. You know I'm a voracious reader. And I've recently come upon Mike Booker, um, who is a former PGA Tour professional, a member of the Texas Hall of Fame, Golf Hall of Fame, and now an author. And I'm a new fan. Mike, welcome to our show. Nice to see you. Hey, great to be here, Mark. Thanks for making the time for me. Yeah, well, look, it's my pleasure. When, when, when I see a book, because, look, I, I'm a golf instructor deep down. Uh, I love the game. I'm a golf nerd. And this podcast is there to help people, right? So when I see a book that's going to help people do competitive golf better, I'm like, I'm all in. So I had to introduce you to our audience. And with that being said, please, would you just give us the brief bio, a little bit about who you are? Sure. Well, um, I uh, grew up outside of Los Angeles and uh, uh, came to University of Houston on a golf scholarship at the time back in 73. Mm -hmm. And um, just uh, we played, we won the NCAA my senior year where I was uh, an All-American, All-Southwest Conference, and then jumped to right into the tour school right after I graduated from the University of Houston yeah. in, in 77. And um, made it through the tour school and I ended up being the, uh, for the time I was the youngest guy in the PGA tour. I was probably too yeah. young looking uh -huh. back on it, but I was 22. Um, but uh, I realized for the longest time, I mean, decades that, that other guys uh, that I was competing against had something I didn't have. I, I, I felt like I did everything pretty well. You know, I felt like I hit the ball as well as they did. I put it about as good as they did, but I, for, for many, many years, I just couldn't figure out why all these guys were beating my butt all the time. And I finally figured out that, and, and this is really what my book is all about. I figured out that I was a, uh, I was just a golf group played tournaments. And these guys who were succeeding so well were what I call real tournament golfers. They had the characteristics of, of a tournament golfer, you know, no excuses, taking responsibility for every shot. Um, they didn't feel like they lived in a world that had good breaks or bad breaks. They just went about their business. And most importantly, I think, uh, for what I call the tournament golfer in my book, they are very process oriented, which we've all heard a lot about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if they've got a 10 foot putt on last hole to win a tournament, the true tournament golfer, in my view, is they're not really thinking about, oh, if I make this putt, I win the tournament or, you know, how good this trophy is going to look in my study. They're really just work in their process, pre-shot routine, and they're just, all they can do is hit the best putt they can hit and see what happens. When I was 22, some 45, 46 years ago, I went to see uh, Jackie Burke, uh, who right. was in Houston, and I called him and up. And 100 years old just the other day. Huh? <laughs> yes, a couple of Sundays ago. He sure did. I called him up and I said, Mr. Burke, this is Mike Booker. We've met a few times. I'm uh, out here on the PGA Tour. I'm struggling, particularly with the putter. And I said, would you, would you mind, you know, giving me some help? And he said, absolutely. Come on over book. So I went over there, <clears throat> it was about 15, 20 minutes from my house. And I got there and there was a huge Texas rainstorm when I got, and he said, come on into the office. And so we putted some balls on his office, <clears throat> in his office. And he said, you know, your stroke looks fine. He said, uh, and he, he, he kind of looked me in the eye from about, you know, it seemed like a, about a foot away. And he said, here's your problem. He said, never, ever try and make a putt. And of course I'm 22 and I tell the story in the book. I think, what are you talking about? Never try and make a putt. This, that's the most, I didn't say it out loud because I always treated Mr. Burke with great reverence. reverence. And was, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and when he spoke, you better listen. But I, uh, I really, if I'm being honest, I really didn't quite understand what he was talking about. And the truth is when people ask me over the last umpteen years, 30, 40 years, what's the best advice I've ever received, that was it. And um, and when I tell people that, never try and make a putt, they look at me the way that I probably looked at Mr. Burke, very yeah. incredulous. Uh, would that be? And what Mr. Burke was trying to tell me, and I did finally pick it up, you know, 20 years later, was that you, once you hit the putt <clears throat> or hit a shot for that matter, you're out of it. You have no more control over it. Mm -hmm. So he was trying to really teach me that once you hit that putt, you've got to, you know, pick your line, pick your speed, hit your putt. But once you hit it, you're, you're done. There's nothing more for you to do and to worry about the putt, to try and make the putt ahead of time in your head is going to get in the way. It's, you know, it's going to destroy your process because now you're thinking of results instead of process. And once you start thinking results, you're kind of toast. And so, um, 
So that was really my first introduction to the concept way back, you know, literally 46 years ago um, to the concept of, hey, just do, just roll that ball down the line. Or if you're, you know, over an iron shot, hitting it over a lake, you know, don't, don't worry about whether you're going to get it over the lake, just hit your shot and it will get over the lake. Mm. I'm so glad you would share that story about Mr. Burke. You know, he's a hero of mine and a uh, good friend, Steve Elkington, you well know, also University of Houston grad and major champion, yeah. Clara's champion. He's Elk has done it all, basically. And Elk tells it as it is. You know, he doesn't beat around the bush very much. And he was on the show, and I believe it was either he or Hell Sutton that had this brush with Mr. Burke, where they went to his house. And I think maybe it was Steve. I, I don't want to butcher the story, but he goes, so I said, Mr. Burke, you know, I'm about to go on the PGA tour. What advice do you have for me? And apparently they were on the back porch and the back porch was raised up a little bit. And apparently Jackie pushes him like this and he's right on the edge of the porch and he <laughs> feels himself wanting to fall backwards off the porch and he catches himself like this. And Burke goes, well, that's what playing tournament golf feels like. <laughs> what a great story. But what, that's a great story. That's the thing. And this is why I think what you've penned is such a good idea because Every golfer watching this or listening to this, man, woman, elderly, young, we've all experienced that where you turn up the tournament spigots and things are just different. Tournament golf is a different animal, huh? Well, that's the thing. Um, when I went to, to University of Houston, we had about, back then, we had about 25 guys on the team. And these guys, we had guys from Singapore. We had guys from all over the place. We had Nick Faldo for a short time. We had- I did Like three all, weeks or something. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> all, these, all these great players. And um, they, uh, there's only room for five. And so, it, you know, coach, what Coach Williams was great at was throwing everybody in the deep end and see who could swim, you know, to the edge. And so um, the- just like tournament golf versus regular golf, when all of all of us would go back home, and uh, I made the team, but you know, twenty guys didn't basically make the team. They had to go home and explain to all of their friends who they were teeing it up with every day and shooting 68, 66, How could how could they possibly not make the team? And the answer is because tournament golf is a whole different animal than just going out and playing golf. Yeah, Coach Williams behind me. That plaque right over there, that's the Dave Williams Award. Fantastic. Named after him. That was for, I got that back in 2009, National Collegiate Coach of the Year. And it's something uh, I, I, I hold with great pride because, you know, I've always been a golf teacher, but being in college golf coaching for a while, I learned quickly enough how to communicate with folks, I guess, to help them find their best under pressure, find their best in tournaments. Congratulations. That's a, that's a huge award. This is not about me. I'm actually trying no. to square to some, you know, stuff you've put in the book, which the bit I've seen so far, I've thoroughly enjoyed. And there was one chapter, I'm not sure the chapter, but it was basically about controllables. And, and when you're out there, when you're a tournament golfer, not a golfer who plays tournaments, you understand that there are things that are in your control and things that are out of your control. And I'd love you just to gloss over those a little bit, because I feel like there's a whole lot of stuff that people listening to this or watching it can learn because sometimes we get so drawn into the white noise of it all, you know, this and that and stuff that's completely irrelevant when it comes to being a tournament golfer. Well, no doubt. Uh, there's a couple of stories that come to mind. Um, the, the 2009 masters um, had um, gosh. Oh, name the nine yeah. masters well my brother won the 2008 masters and he gave the jack was kenny perry sorry let me start yeah, over exactly yeah and, and, and angel cabrera ended up winning but kenny perry had the lead to like the 71st hole i think it was right exactly so talking about uh, uh talking about that in 2009 kenny perry came to the masters and he had this uh this, this his process that week was what he called to be aggressively patient and he also was not going to look at the scoreboards, talking about, you know, not paying attention to what you can't control. You can't control the scoreboard. You can only have somewhat of control over, you know, your score on that scoreboard. So he, sure enough, it's working great for him, this, this aggressively patient process. He gets up on 16 the last day, hits it six inches on 16. And for the first time, he looks up at the scoreboard. He hadn't looked at the scoreboard all week, and he sees he has a two-stroke lead. Tells his caddy, 
just got a par 17 and 18 and we're masters champion. And at that moment, by his own admission, at that moment, because he was worried about what other people doing, not what he was doing. And, and I would say threw away his process for a moment and got into results oriented thinking. Of course, we all know what happened. He bogeyed 17 and 18 and Angel Cabrera beat him in the playoff where he made another bogey. And so, um, that, that story is in my book. And because I, I had, I had read that, uh, you know, verbatim from, from Kenny Perry. And so it was just a, a situation where he was more worried about what other people were doing, got out of his process. And once you get into the result oriented thinking, it's as Mr. Burke told me, you know, don't, don't, don't try and ever make a putt, same idea. Just do, just keep, stick to your knit and keep doing what you're doing. Mm. I I, I want to touch um, uh, another Mr. Burke story and then get to a Nicholas anecdote and then talk about some of the things that one can't control uh, that you've listed in the book there. Um, but Mr. Burke also, and I, I heard this from Jim McLean, who's been on this very show, who I kind of hold as a bit of a mentor and I'm fortunate to know him. Um, Jim McLean was struggling with his game, not driving it very well. And apparently he went to go and see Jackie and Mr. Burke said to him, go down to the beach, Galveston Bay. He said, and go and hit some tee shots into the ocean. And I guess like you, Jim says to me, he goes, I'm like, this guy's lost his mind. So he goes down there and he hits a few balls into the ocean and he comes back. And, and so Mr. Burke goes, so how did it go? And Jim's like, fine. And Mr. Burke's like, did you hit them well? And he goes, yeah, hit them all dead straight. And the <laughs> lesson was, and to your process, your process thing was like into the ocean, you weren't handcuffed by water and trees and bunkers and i've got to hit this in the fairway you're just swinging away and you're kind of doing you i guess that's where you're going a little bit with things that you can control a little bit right absolutely in fact um there's a there's this uh, indian proverb that talks about focus and it says something uh, i'm paraphrasing but a native indian says something like um focus is not uh, paying attention to the target it, it's ignoring everything that surrounds it Oh, and I've always loved that because real focus is is really just forgetting everything that's bad. You know, and talking about what you can control and what you can't control. Um, that's that to me. That's a great example of of what focus really is. It's not just on the target. It's ignoring all the bad stuff around it. Mm. Well, you listed three elements in the chapter I read, and it was mindset. You can control your mindset. You control your can, can control your effort, and you can control your behavior. Now. I want to start with the third one of those three and get your take, please, because golf is that weird thing where you talk to golfers, golfers who play tournaments, not tournament golfers, and you're like, why do you play the game? And they're like, well, for cause relaxation, it's a stress relief. But they're the most stressed individuals in the world. <laughs> right? Then they had one bad shot, and then the the – Apple cart is upset and they lose their minds and stuff. So, so talk about controlling behavior a little bit, please. Sure. Well, you know, my book um, is not just another book on, you know, mastering the mental side of golf. My, my book is about winning golf tournaments. Uh -huh. And so we all know that uh, the mindset, it, which you do have some control over um, is huge in, in terms of what you can control and what you can't control. So in the book, I talk a little bit about with regard to mindset. So much of that, is uh, and studies have backed me up on this. So much of mindset is your self-talk. Now, what the, the a few of the studies I had uh, researched for the book was that you know tournament golfers, great golfers, tend to have very good self-talk, and meaning um, that they're not going to run themselves down and they're not going to beat themselves up. And they typically uh, the the self-talk for the uh, for the tournament golfers, the good players, is in the first person. So it might go something like. I can do this. Yeah, I can. I can I'm going to be okay. Uh, that ball's all right. You know, um, the in terms of uh, having a good mindset, the the golfer who plays tournaments, you know, the one who's really not thinking really well has terrible self talk. They beat themselves up. They often uh, say things to themselves that they wouldn't say to their worst enemy. And so, um, sure. and and interestingly, in my research, I found out that that's usually in this second person or third person where they say to themselves you're such a choker you're, yeah. you're you can't make this putt what is wrong with you uh as if they're outside their body so uh mindset i think the basis of being a successful tournament golfer and not just a golfer who plays tournament 
mindset wise, understanding what you can control, much like Mr. Burke's story. Once you hit that putt, you can't control what happens. You can't control the outcome, but you can control how you think about it. And having great self-talk, I think, um, is a huge benefit. You remind me, uh, I digress, but this is sort of how my mind works. Welcome to my podcast. Um, <laughs> then, it was a few years ago. It was funny enough at the WM Phoenix Open um, that we've just gotten done with here in 2023. And on the 16th hole, it's all pomp and circumstance before the event. And then during the event, it's kind of like a circus with some golf happening in the middle of it. And um, Gary Woodland does great work. They all do for charity. But um, there was a young lady that he met on the 16th tee. Her name was Amy Buckerstedt. And I'm not sure um, what she was, but she was handicapped. And so, but she played golf. And so she gets on the tee. And so Gary says to her, so do you want to play the hole with me? And she was like, sure. And so she gets on the tee and they've got her mic'd up and she's like, oh my. And she goes, I can. And she, she said this all the time. She goes, I can do this. I've got this. And so she hits the shot and it goes in the air and the crowds go bananas. It ends up in the bunker, but she's walking down toward the green and she looks up and the fans are going crazy. And she's like, they love me. Gary, and she's like, they <laughs> love me. And at this stage, I've got tears streaming down my cheeks, okay? I remember. Um, yeah, you remember this. And then she, she gets it up and down, right? She's in the bunker, and this bunker shot's hard, okay? And she gets in, and her dad goes, here's the sandwich, and she makes a few swings, and she goes, I've got this. I can do this. To your self-talk thing. On the green, eventually makes the putt. They just go, the place just erupts. It was amazing. I remember that. Now, here's the thing, and I and, and I'm, I want you to go to the self-talk some more. She now has a foundation. And it's, I think it's, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it might be like, you can do this, or I've got this, or something like this. And she's raising money, and it was all just, and everyone fell in love with this interaction because they heard her just saying, I've got this. I can do this. Because it was, in a situation like this, even the pros tell you, you set up for failure because golf is so hard and everyone's watching you. Yet she talked her way through it. Now, I want to ask you this question because you've seen the comings and the goings and you qualified enough to write about it because she had a childlike faith about her. Why is it that us cerebral adults will find the worst case scenario when it comes to self-talk half, more than half of the time? Do, do you have a take on that at all or not? You know, it's really interesting. Um, I, my job is I'm a financial advisor in Houston and uh, we... I mean, I don't know the answer, but I suspect that we are sort of wired to pay more attention to negative things, yeah. uh, maybe, you know, to 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 survive. I always tell my clients that when they bring in the latest, you know, market guru has said, you know, that the, the market's going to crash and all these good reasons. And I say, you know what, um, that gets our attention more than, you know, uh, than anything good. For example, when there's a family of five drives through, you know, through town and they, and they crash in a fiery uh, crash and they all die. That gets our attention because Love it's such a horrible know. thing, but nobody talks about the million cars that drove through town just fine and safe. And so I think we're a bit wired that way for negative. Um, and, and there's a certain, I talk about it in my book, there's a certain amount culturally where we, you know, where it's, it's culturally, um, uh, preferred in a way to, to take a humble approach and say, oh, I'm such a dope or, you know, I'm, you're such an idiot or something like that to sort of fend off uh, criticism that we might receive from others. So that, that's just my take on it. I know that in, in golf, um, the, 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 the best golfers, the tournament golfers, as I call them, they, they have great self-talk. And, you know, and the other thing is that there's something that throws people off when they're in tournaments, uh, you know, people will tell me all the time, you know, they start playing tournaments and they, they immediately understand how different tournament golf is than, than recreational golf. And one of the hard things they have to, to, is to focus on that because they're so, you know, so result oriented. And so, and I'm sure you've had many guests talk about this, but the breathing aspect uh, oh, to bring yeah. yourself back to the present, to actually, you know, take count your breaths to make a cycle, you know, you inhale and you exhale, that is the, to me, that is the number one way to get back in the present, get back in a good mindset. Um, one, one story I tell in the book is I was at the, uh, I was at the tour school in 1977, the same tour school I talked about a minute ago, right out of college, uh, Pinehurst number four. I shot 76 the first day. I was in 91st place. 
Okay. And you know, as you know, Mark, the tour school back then was three stages. Start out with about five thousand people worldwide. You went through three different stages. I was at the final stage. There were 150 of us. They were going to take 25 at the end. And I'm in 91st place. And a uh, a, a front, a, a norther came in, huge wind, cold as it can be the next day. And I shot 71. And I think I went to about eighth place because it was so brutal. I hit a wedge for my second shot on the green to a par five. So it was just about a 30, 30 mile an hour wind, terribly cold, tough conditions. So I made it through all that. I'm on the 72nd hole. And I'm in good shape. I know, I know I'm fine. I don't remember what I shot third round, but I'm in great shape. I'm under par on this round, so I'm, I'm looking really good. And uh, knock a drive right down the middle on 18. I tug a five iron into the left front bunker, but that's okay. I'm a good bunker player, and I'm fine. And um, I step into this bunker, Mark, and I remember like it was yesterday. This 22-year-old kid, I said, I'm going to be a tour player. Finally, I'm going to be a tour player. Yeah. This is, you know, this is, this is the most amazing, all my life, this is all I wanted. And I step into the bunker and I blade it over the green into a back bunker and the pins up front and I'm in the back bunker and, um, I get out of, I get out of the bunker. I've just bladed this ball out of, and my mind races, it just accelerates. Talk about mindset. Mm -hmm. I can, I actually visualize I'm not even out of the bunker. I visualize all telling all my friends back home in Houston that I double bogey the last hole to not get my tour card. This is what I'm thinking in the trap. I'm thinking about how am I going to tell them that? What are they going to say? And, uh, you know, completely out of the present now, completely, you know, started with me saying, oh, I'm going to be a tour player. Now, now I'm, now things are accelerating. My heartbeat is accelerating. I remember just thinking like uh, just in total panic mode. So now it's, and it's still my shot. These guys are on the green and I've hit it in the back bunker. So I had experimented with breathing. And so instinctually, I just started counting my breaths because I didn't know what else to do. As I've said, and we all know golf is a very lonely game. There wasn't anybody there to hit me on the back, you know, and say, okay, Mike, you know, give it your best shot. Get this. <laughs> Nobody's there to do that, of course. And so I started counting my breaths. And um, if you've ever tried counting your breaths, it's very difficult to, to get past, say, five breath cycles without thinking about what, you know, what am I having for lunch or, you know, yeah. what am I going to wear today? It's very difficult to do, but my heart is racing. Blood pressure, no doubt, is out of control. And so, um, but by breathing, helping me get back to the present, I, I was still obviously nervous, but I all thoughts of, you know, explaining my double bogey that hadn't happened yet <laughs> out of my mind. I went back there and, and I've got a, I've got a downhill lie in this stupid bunker. And um, anyway, long story already. Sorry about that. Long story short. I don't remember where I hit the ball, but I got it up and down. I, I'd love to tell you, I hit it a foot from the hole and I'm such a hero, you know, but uh, I didn't, I don't remember what I did, but I got it up and down and I did get my card. I uh, did get my tour card that year, but it was the, and back to your original question, the mindset your mind races everywhere, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 times during one round of golf, it races into the future or, you know, just as bad. It, it goes back to the, you know, to the past where you missed the five foot putt on last hole and you you forget to focus on the shot at hand and you're still thinking about the last hole. So anyway, you know, um, you know what I love about that? I appreciate you for sharing that story. You know what I love about it? Um, first off, for the folks who are just listening on audio, I'm looking at Mike. You can watch this on YouTube. And a large part of that story, I could see you closing your eyes like you were reliving this. This, I mean, it was it was graphic. It was real. I could see how you were going through this. But it is, and I love it too because it's so emblematic to everybody who's listening to this thing because they've had this happen more often than not. And the problem is, and you well document this, is like, you know, catching yourself enough, stopping to stop the panic to actually just breathe which is the first thing that ever happens to a human being just seems like it's the farthest thing from us. You know, we've got to like fix our golf swing or we're going to do this. You're going to uh, breathing. Is, is, it's essentially the life force. And if, and when you're panicking, that's not happening very well. And studies back it up. Um, the, when you breathe and of course you, you know, you, in the book, you t I talk about exactly how to breathe, but you breathe through your nose, you, you exhale through your mouth. It, the studies have shown that actually it, it ignites the parasympathetic nervous system and you actually do lower your heartbeat and you lower your blood pressure because it's a more of a relaxation mode. So I would urge everybody when you're under the gun, whether you're trying to win the club championship or trying to knock your buddy out of five bucks, 
when you start to realize that you're throwing yourself into the future, your mind is going into the future, worrying about this or about that, or going back to the past where you've messed up a whole, uh, get right back by, by counting your breaths. I'm a believer. I've proved it with myself. Um, I've beaten blood pressure issues. I've got, I've gotten off medication by proper breathing and cold plunging. I actually had a guy, a yoga, a yoga instructor and a, with these, you know, ice bath experts, and they also talk about the breathing as you do, which is so well founded. Um, the 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 third thing, the effort. But I, I just want to camp on mindset a little while longer, if that's cool with you. Sure. Because, you know, there you are drawing yourself inward a bit and focusing on your breathing to kind of blot out the circumstance. But you've played golf against the greats. You've listed some of them, and including Jack Nicholas. And in that chapter there that I was reading, uh, you share a really f a story I didn't know. Um, about Nicholas at Lytham in 63. And uh, he's in contention, and all of a sudden, mind starts wandering and stuff and wrapping himself up with what the competitors were doing. And it didn't end up very well, even for the Golden Bear. Please share. It's a great story, um, and it's it's an unusual story. I did a lot of digging to find it. So Nicholas is playing. It's the last round, back nine of the Open. And he, even the great Jack Nicholas, the greatest player ever, in my my view, um, he had Phil Rogers and uh, somebody else, I can't remember now, playing behind him. And he was listening to see if the gallery would cheer if they made a birdie or not. And he, and he didn't hear, it was kind of windy and he was kind of upwind. He, so he didn't hear a gallery cheer like he assumed they would do if they made birdies. So the other he guy, thought- I'm going to interrupt you. I just looked ahead. The other guy was Bill Rogers. I just glanced oh. at the book so, so Rogers, yeah. Rogers and uh, and- Phil Rogers and Bob Charles were right in behind him. Okay. So Nicholas, you know, it's it's hard to believe because he's such a great thinker. But anyway, he thinks he's got a two-stroke lead now because they didn't make birdie. And he gets up on uh, 17 and the pin is back. And because it's a uh, he's got a two-stroke lead, he feels like he can be a little bit more aggressive. His caddy tells him to hit a three iron. He says, no, I'm going to hit the two iron and get it back there. He It's too much club. Ball goes long. He makes bogey. But he still feels like he's in, you know, he's still, because in his mind, he feels like that that, that, behind, that he's got this two-stroke lead. Well, in reality, he didn't hear the gallery cheer a birdie that was made behind him because he was, because of the wind. So he came in the 18 thinking he was still in, in good shape, everything's fine, uh, plays conservatively. He gets in and he finds out that, that they, not only was there a birdie, they both made birdie. And he was out, did not win the Open that year. And so... Um, he said that, you know, he said something along the lines, how could I be so stupid? That's never going to happen again. It's, don't you think, like you talk about mindset, it takes presence of mind to catch oneself and breathe. It takes presence of mind in the Nicholas sort of situation to, to say, okay, uh, someone else is doing that. I've got to stick to my process to use your vernacular. It's almost like a discipline. Uh, would would you agree? Could you, you know, educate on that a little bit? Sure, uh, Mark. I totally agree with that. Just like uh, with you have to really catch yourself on uh, when you're giving yourself, you're beating yourself up with bad, you know, uh, self talk, mm -hmm. and you have to catch yourself when you realize that you're, you know, in Nicholas's case, if I was his caddy, I would try. I would have told him, look, don't, let's not worry about those guys behind us. Of course, that was young in his career, yeah. but so let's not worry about what's going on there. Because we can't, we, you know, again, back to the control. You don't have any control out of what, what Rogers uh, or anybody behind you is doing. The only control you have is what we're doing right now. And so that so that takes practice and training. And some people just can't do it. And none of us can do it perfectly. Uh, you're always going to, your mind is just like counting, you know, five cycles of breaths. I dare anybody to try that Sorry. Five, bro, without thinking of something else that, that, you know, floats through your mind. So so, Mark, the answer is you've got to train yourself to catch yourself to do that. I used to actually say when I was when I was getting ahead of myself, when I was thinking about, oh, you know, where's the pin on 14 when I'm on number 12, um, that I would say to myself, cancel. I would just say cancel. Oh, okay. And just that was my key word. It sounds a little hokey, but that was where I recognized that I am I'm not in the present anymore. And, and when you're not in the present, you know, like the like the Kenny Perry story, you're just going to be in really tough shape. There's another story on the opposite side of things. Al Geiberger, 1977, Al Geiberger rocks the golf world and shoots a 59 in Memphis at Colonial Golf Club. Yeah, then that golf course is hard too. Okay, that, Good that, golf course. I played there. And so 
he goes to the the press uh, the press interviews him afterward, and one of the questions he gets is, well, "What was it like, uh, Al? You know, keeping track of your score as you were eight under, nine under, ten under on the back nine? And Guyberger says, "Are you kidding me?" He says, "He says when you got a round like that going, the last thing you want to do is actually be aware of the score." He said, "That's the kiss of death." And so <laughs> there's a guy back in 1977, 40 some years ago, that understood that when you've got something going. You've got to, you know, and you've got to do everything you can do to, in his case, he says, I'm not even thinking about the score. How many times, Mark, have, has a guy shot a 60 or a 59 and they almost all say the same thing? I didn't realize it was, you know, I didn't realize it was quite that good. I was just out there playing. I knew I had a good score going, but I had no idea that it was going to be a 59 because I, as Guyberger said, when you got a round like that going, don't stop and start counting how many under you are. Just keep pushing. That's the original Mr. 59, Al Geiberger. I love that story. Uh, to that, uh, Pebble Beach a few seasons ago, <laughs> I know the story because I'm not name dropping yet, but Ray Romano, you know, hilarious comic comedian. He was playing alongside um, his professional partner. And, and over at the Monterey Peninsula, this young man had a putt for 59, but he didn't realize it because he thought the golf course was a par 72, which was actually a par 71. Hmm. On the last hole, he misses and shoots 60. And Ray's like, hey, did you realize that was for 59? He goes, I had no idea. <laughs> Crazy, isn't it? That's, you know, and people who don't play tournaments or don't, you know, compete a lot, that would be almost unbelievable. How could, you know, how could that possibly be? It's because they're in the present, they're not getting ahead of themselves, and they're just playing golf. Yeah. And it's an effort to, an, an effort to keep the correct mindset. And the third point you make there of the controllables is controlling effort. Now, if I throw out the term effort, people are going to be like, well, yes, Immelman and Booker are wanting me to uh, to hit more golf balls or go practice more. But I would almost say that, you know, going to hit balls is intellectually lazy because it's harder to work on your breathing or your self-talk, right? Um, but but to talk about effort some. Is effort the effort you expend in practice or is this effort to doing the right things mentally and emotionally and all that sort of stuff? Well, it's all of that, Mark, I would say. What I've always tried to do and I've always tried to tell people is that um, so oftentimes, like you talk about people, you'll see people at your club or the golf course, you know, out there beating balls. And so oftentimes, like the big guy who hits it 330 yards, there, why is he hitting driver so much? Why is he on the range practicing driver? I don't understand. Uh, he's a terrible chipper or, or you know, his putting is, you know, his technique it needs to be improved. So I've always tried to tell people to work on those things that you don't really like because you're not really good at it mm -hmm. and try and, you know, bring more balance to your game. And so often, but oftentimes you see just the opposite. You see somebody who's a, you know, or, or somebody who's a great putter, you know, they spend all the time in the putting green. Of course, that's hard to argue with, but um, the truth of the matter is I've always tried to, and I've always tried to tell people to f identify those parts of your game that, you know, be truthful with yourself and get input from a mentor but what part of your game do you really need to work on and spend more time on that? I, but, you know, I say that, but over the years, when I look back, I don't spend enough time on my short game. Um, you know, I just don't, do. but I really should. Yeah, so it, it's a discipline. Um, you know, it's maybe why those guys, you know, when, when I was on tour kept beating me up so much, maybe they were spending more time on you know, following my advice and, and um, instead of <laughs> me just talking about it. <laughs> yeah. It's like me. I, I, I realized my aspirations of being the best golfer in the world were scuppered when I couldn't beat my 13 year old younger brother. And so that's how I became a golf instructor because of this. Um, look, Mike, folks, the, 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 the book's name is the tournament golfers playbook. I, I believe it is right. Handbook playbook. Um, playbook. please share, share the, the parting shot with the, uh, with the viewers, listeners, and then I'll let you share where they can find the book. So, so do you have like a, a parting shot or a bow you can tie on this conversation just to. I, I, I think I do. Um, so people ask me all the time, why did, you know, why'd you write this book? And it's interesting. I had no aspirations to write a book. I, at all, I, I didn't, it wasn't even on my radar whatsoever, but about uh, five or six years ago, Jonathan Dismuke, uh, who is, uh, was, and still is the head, the golf coach um, at university of Houston, my alma mater, he had this really talented team. I mean, really good players. And he said to me, I don't know what the problem is. We're just not, we're not getting the job done. Would you, I know you played in a lot of tournaments. Would you come talk to them? 
And so I said, sure. I mean, I was flattered and I, I'd be honored to do that. So to prepare to talk to, I was about 15 or 20 young men. I put an outline together of what I thought was important. Exactly the same things, Mark, you and I are talking about today, you know, being your own best friend and some of the breathing techniques and uh, know what you can control and what you can't control. Anyway, I sat down in front of these boys. And I had their full attention. The first thing out of my mouth was, you all think that you're tournament golfers, but I suspect you're just golfers who play tournaments. And that was the first time I said that. And they all Bang. looked at each other. In the bar yeah. <laughs> well, that was the idea. And, you know, some of the people have described my book as, as a tough love book. Um, so they, I went on to explain, you know, what a tournament golfer is, you know, no excuses, take responsibility, stay in the present. Uh, you don't get bad breaks. You know, the, the golfer plays tournaments thinks that the, they get all the bad breaks and always a bag full of excuses, that sort of thing. And so, um, I, you know, I felt like I kind of connected with some of them. And, and uh, sure enough, a few weeks later, they, they won a big tournament. So I thought, well, you know, that's great. Maybe uh, maybe I spoke to them. Maybe a few of them, you know, picked up on some of the ideas. So I decided to expand my outline just to give to friends that maybe, you know, some ideas that could help them. And it got bigger and bigger. And I realized at one point I said, you know, maybe, maybe I've got a book here. So I went and researched golf books and I saw there were about 65,000 golf books out there. And so I thought, well, I don't know if the world really needs another golf book. But as I dug a little deeper, I realized that, uh, first of all, a lot of the golf books were on the mental side of the game, which is great. That was my interest. And then so many of them are written by golf psychologists. And I thought to myself, well, wouldn't it be good then for a tournament golfer to write a book? Not just, you know, I, I wondered, did these golf psychologists, how many five footers have they stood over to qualify for the U.S. Amateur? Or have they stood on the 72nd hole, as I explained earlier, needing a par on the last hole, you know, to get to get my card? So I had done that. So I thought, all right, I'll write this book. And uh, from the from the tournament golfer perspective, and uh, so that's really how it all got started, and uh, and it was a lot of fun. I hope I hope that uh, your listeners will have as much fun reading the book as, as I did writing it. Well, you know what I mean. You you said this book is for golfers who want to become tournament golfers, and then I think you prefer, prefaced in the introduction or the preface or whatever it was. You're like, look, if you don't want to be a tournament golfer, this is not necessarily for you. I would contend and say, look, for every golfer listening to this. It is for them because, you know, no matter the level you play at, you want to improve. If you're listening to this, you're listening to this podcast for a reason. It's not my intellect or your intellect. Folks want to get better. So, okay, that's the segue for, for where do they, how do they go and find the book? Where, where do they go for it, please? Sure. And let me, let me say one thing real quick, Mark, it, 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 on what you just said, piggybacking on what you just said. I, at the end of every chapter, I put in what's called a life hack. Life hacks, yeah. And, and what that is, is taking the lesson learned from that chapter and taking it off the golf course and using it in your business or your personal life. I realized that everything I've accomplished, whatever that might be off the golf course was because of what golf taught me mm -hmm. and taught me about myself and taught me about others. So I decided about halfway through the book, I thought I need to put something in there. So that was what the life hacks are. And some of the best reviews I've had of the book, interestingly, uh, are, are non-golfers. Um, my editor, I'll never forget the editor of the call. She called me up. She'd never played golf. I'm not sure she knew what end of the club to even hold if you handed it to her. She's really a lovely, a lovely young lady. But anyway, she said, Mike, she said, I don't know what a sucker pin is, but I want to be a tournament golfer. <laughs> <laughs> sucker pin. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's when I thought, you know what? All right, that's great. So you you, you do want to, I'm in my opinion, you want to be a tournament golfer off the golf course and everything you do. You don't want to complain. You don't want to have excuses. It it uh, you want to be that tournament golfer everywhere you go. Okay. So where do they get the book now? All right. Sorry. So the book <laughs> <laughs> is uh, I know I'm passionate. the book is a TG Playbook. So tournament golfer TG Playbook com is my web page i've got a lot of stuff on there there's a button on there my favorite button buy now all right Hit that button it'll take you right to right to the book and uh i i again I, I i hope you guys enjoy reading as much as as i did writing it and it's available on amazon too right yes and that button will take you right to amazon oh, perfect okay cool uh, look, what a fun conversation what a great topic um and for me i love things because i love golf information but for me, the message is only as good as what it's understood. 
And, and you do a wonderful job of taking some complex topics and making them digestible and easy to apply. So uh, I thank you for the book. I thank you for your time. And and, and I, I hope this thing goes for, to, from strength to strength. Well, thanks a lot. And, and for your listeners as well, there's a place on there where you can email me uh, on my website, you know, tgplaybook.com. There's a spot where they can email me. I am happy to uh, return any questions they have about our conversation today or uh, about what they might read in the book. Golf needs more people like you. Thank you very much. Well, that's nice of you to say. Thank you. Thank you.